And to demonstrate this next thing, what I'm going to do is, oh, I'll go back to that floor plan again. Let me zoom on out. And I'm going to go to that living room space. I'm going to create some custom objects for this living room. There's a little library space, I guess I called it in this drum. Okay, To sort of help us see these things, what I'm going to do is actually switch to the 3D view. That's my little 3D view of the house. I'll switch on over to the other side and I'll adjust the section box so I can sort of see into that space a little bit better. A little too far. Let me zoom on in. I'll cut away that wall. I could even go through and maybe I'll cut away this wall over here so you can sort of see into the house. Beautiful. 3D sections are sort of an incredibly powerful way of looking at things. So you know, go ahead and take advantage of that. Maybe one of the better ways to show off what's going on in your house. Okay, so we have our uh, little uh, well, what is it? Uh, library area here. Let me take out that cabinet over there. We'll go back to the floor plan and let's talk about what I have in mind. I'm going to take up. Oh, I don't see the furniture right now. Let me fix that before we go into it. That's because in this view, I have the furniture turned off right now. I'm going to say visibility graphics and turn the furniture on because I'm going to create some furniture objects. Okay, now you can see those things. Now I'll get rid of them. Okay, so here's the idea. If you only have certain types of objects to work with, you tend to start designing to the limitations of those objects. So if you only have rectangular objects to work with, you'll start making all your walls rectangular because it'll be much easier to put doors and or put you know, desks and furniture and toilets and sinks and stuff like that in there. It sort of is driving it the wrong direction. Yeah. So rather than trying to think about trying to get your building to conform to the components, I want you to think the other way. Design freely and then we'll actually create components to fit your geometry instead. So if you're going to do like the Hannah Honeycomb house, and you're going to do uh, like hexagons, you're going to do parallelograms or something like that, that's good. We just may need to go ahead and kind of come up with custom countertops and custom desks and things like that to fit the wall geometry. Now, as you want to go through and create the geometry, there's a lot of ways to do this. We're going to learn the first technique today, which is called modeling in place. Modeling in place is very good for quickly getting something that's just going to fit the custom geometry, and we're going to just use it in that one project. As we get further along, we'll learn how to do the same basic technique, but to make it more generalizable, to put it as a library part that we can share between several different projects and post on Revit City if we want to share it with the world and share it with other people in the class. Okay, So the same basic technique, it's just going to have a slightly different wrapper around it to make that available for other people to use. We could also, if you happen to be handy in SketchUp, or you happen to be very handy in AutoCAD, or, or you know people who have SketchUp objects or AutoCAD objects, you can bring them in and we can convert them into Revit objects too. So you know, a lot of flexibility, but for today we're going to focus on the first one, okay, just modeling in place. As you model in place, the important thing to kind of keep in mind is that you're really going to be using these whenever the object's going to be used exclusively in this project. You know, where you really want something quickly created and it wants to have a perfect fit. And countertops are like my classic example of this. You know, it's very hard to sort of make a generic countertop. Countertops almost always fit the wall. They should generally fit the wall or some very specific configuration. Limitations of doing it this way is these won't be reusable and resizable. We'll be able to move them around in the project. We'll even be able to copy them within the project, but we won't be able to use them in tomorrow's project. Okay. As you're going through and creating these objects, the general procedure is we're going to use something called the Model in Place tool. And where you find it is under the Home tab. You say Component. And instead of placing a component, you're going to model one in place. That's going to let you create a new one. I always trip over that. There's something about skateboards and I. We immediately like uh, find each other, and then I trip on them. OK, so Model in Place is how we get started. That after you choose to do, do model in place, you're going to choose a family category. Every element's going to have some family associated with it because you need to sort of control what family it belongs to so you can turn it on and turn it off in terms of the visibility. Okay, You're also going to start creating these different forms, solids or voids or combinations of them to kind of create the shape you want. 
And finally, we can set the materials, properties, and finish the family. So let's show you how that works. It'll actually make a lot more sense in context. And we'll start with just this notion of the family category. So I'll say model in place. You get this dialog. It's going to ask you what family this thing should belong to. I'm going to let it belong to the furniture. I'm going to create some just little furniture objects for right now. Say OK. I'll give it a unique name like table one. Say OK. And we're ready to start defining. Okay. Notice the model actually turned a little bit gray. It sort of dimmed out. And I'm in this special little mode, model in place mode, where I need to finish or cancel. I'm sort of locked in right now. I'm defining this sub piece of the model. Okay. What we're going to do now is actually define the geometry of what we want to create as a series of either extrusions, blends, revolves, sweeps, or swept blends. And these can either be solids or voids. And you have to think a little bit creatively, because as you're creating things, sometimes you make them out of solids and add things together. Sometimes you take a solid and do a void and subtract out a piece. There's a lot of different ways to sort of get to the same thing. So you've got to sort of just really figure out what's going to be the best way to create the shape you want. Okay, I'm going to start with the whole notion of a solid extrusion, because that's probably the easiest one for most people to understand. And to do that, I'm going to go to the floor plan view. I will start sketching an extrusion. This can actually, you know the rules. This is like doing floors or anything else. I can sort of create any shape that I like. If I want to have a curved end on it, I can put a curved end on it. If I want to have any shape, I can make it. Okay, but I'm just basically going to create some sort of boundary. I hope that's cleaning up right. I'll tell you in a minute. Then I'm going to sort of set some properties for it. The extrusions always have a start and an end relative to whatever the work plane is. That's the plane where we're drawing it. So for right now, that's set to the top of the first floor. I'm going to start it at zero. That part's fine. I'm going to end it at three feet, kind of countertop height. Then I can choose some materials. Oh, let me make it like cherry wood. I'll say OK. And when I say OK, I can finish the extrusion. Okay. Now note, I'm still in my modeling mode. I haven't finished the entire element. I've just created one form, this extrusion form. And I'm going to stay in that mode for a little bit because I'm going to add some more pieces to this. Okay, So we'll just stay over here. I'll look at it in 3D just to sort of see how we're doing. It's kind of what I had in mind. If you want to, you can choose that extrusion. And I can sort of, oh, do some stretching. You can change it around a little bit. Or if I want to, I can say edit the extrusion or even just look at its properties. And I can reset the values. We'll say three foot two, change the properties of the material, whatever I want. But that's one piece of what I'm creating. Okay, I can go ahead and create another little piece. Oh, for this little object that I'm creating, let me create another little extrusion. This one I'll just do in 3D. I'll make a little round extrusion down here on the floor. Oops, that's an ellipse. Well, why not? I'll finish the extrusion. Oops, that's a little ugly looking. Let me uh, make my circle. I will finish the extrusion. And again, I can sort of pull it up or pull it down. Whatever I need to do, I'm just making little pieces. Now, this is all part of the same element. OK, it's just different forms that are making it up. Now, as another piece, let me go ahead and, oh, I'll make a void piece. Show you what that might be good for. For the void, let me go through and I'll make something else in here. I'll sort of stretch it out. Notice this one's sort of half in, half out. So when I finish that extrusion, you'll see it actually cuts a hole in the other piece. I can choose that void and sort of push it around a little bit or change its properties. If I want to just get a very precise distance in there. Okay. And now by playing around a little bit, this thing which I originally thought might be a countertop, well, what if instead I changed its material properties? 
Let me go ahead and make it brick. And before you know it, I actually have something that's a pretty good fireplace, or a pizza oven, or whatever it is that you want to do in there. But this is one of those pieces of geometry, you're just not going to find that in the library. Okay, but you can go ahead and do things. So just even with something as simple as extruding, which is sort of the simplest thing to do, you can start creating all these different shapes that you need that aren't quite there. Like people have wanted to know about how to make stove pipes, or how to make uh, chimney pipes, or just any sort of random shape like that. If you can extrude it, we can make it. So you can extrude off the floor. If you want to, we can extrude off of an elevation and pull it out this way, too. You can go really either way you want to. Okay, so extruding sort of the most basic one. So let's kind of start with that. The other ones I'm going to show you are all really variations on the theme, because it's all going to be, we're going to sketch one profile, we'll sketch another profile, and we'll sort of just really set the difference between where those two things are, and it'll try to create mass between them. Okay. So let me show you the next one. The next one that sort of comes in the list is the blend. So let's talk about that one. Okay, Blends look like this. Well, let me go to the first floor plan and show you. It's really the idea that you're going to have two different things, two different profiles, and bring them together. So the easiest example is probably, oh, let me go through and create like a shape like that as the base. And then I'll edit the top. And I'll create a shape like this. I'll say, let's take a look at the blend properties. And it's going to go from, oh, say, 0 up to 5 feet tall. I can give it a material if I want to. And what it does is it just sort of brings those two shapes together. Okay. Now, for a nice tapered column, that's actually probably the easiest way to go through and create something like that. But the shapes can be more complicated than that. Let me come over here. I can squash that, erase that as I want. Okay. Or if I edit the blend, let me edit the top of it. There it is. I can even do something like this. I'll rotate it, Let's see if I can. Let me do it in the other, uh, let me choose it, and then I'll rotate it. Okay. I'll say rotate. Give it a little twist. Okay. So very quickly, we're starting to get some really strange and complex forms, but you can have a lot of fun with this stuff. If I want to, oh, copy that thing. Let's see if we can copy that from here. Maybe I'll have one of these intersecting my blend, too. That's not quite intersecting right now. I think I'm going to have to do something a little bit. And I do need to do this every once in a while. I'll need to sort of help it out a little bit by telling that I'm going to cut the geometry by choosing the void, then choosing the blend. OK, there we get it out of there. Usually my voids will do a nice job. Okay, But every once in a while, I have to sort of tell it explicitly that you're going to need to cut with the void. OK, so blends, get the sort of idea of blends. Kind of two different shapes. Doesn't have to be two squares. It could be hexagons to circles. It could be whatever you want. Okay. Oh, the next one down the list, just to kind of get you going with, is a revolution. Let's kind of show you what that looks like. Revolves are actually pretty straightforward. What you have to do with revolves is as follows you need to sort of give it a profile, and you also need to give it an axis of revolution, and it will spin it around that. Okay. And that's really good for making all sorts of nice shapes. So for example, if I go back to that floor plan view, and I say revolution, or revolve, what I do is first go through and get the boundary line. So I'll say, great, let me give a boundary. And again, it could be any shape I like. Next, I'm going to give it an axis of revolution. If I make that axis of revolution just really right at the edge here, let me draw it. Okay. This will be a surface that doesn't have any hole in it. It's actually going to just sort of revolve right around there. Okay. And if I look at it in 3D, 
there it is kind of poking through the floor. However, if I come on back and I say, no, I really want this to be more like a donut or a torus, I can revolve it, edit the revolve, maybe pull that out a little bit. And when I revolve that, you get the hole in the center. Is that? Ah, tricky issue. You want to stand that thing up, don't you? Okay, and when you you have to sort of actually be careful about how you revolve it in order to make it do that. I can't just rotate that up. I wish I could, but it's sort of defined on the floor. So here's what you got to do. Perfect question, because it's exactly what I want to show you next. This is where it gets a little bit tricky, oh, but only for revolves. Revolves have the unique problem of our just being a little bit harder to define this way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define a reference plane that's let me going to draw vertically. I'm going to draw in elevation as opposed to drawing on the floor and set that as my work plane. Then I can revolve in the vertical direction instead. So this is going to be very much like what we had to do when we wanted to extrude the profile of a roof. So what I do is take a reference plane. I'll draw one. I can actually just pick one too, but let me draw one. I'll just put it out there so it'll be easy to spot. And now I will go through and I'm going to give it a name just so that reference plane is easy for me to grab. I'm going to call this the uh, revolved surface. Say OK. So, so far so good. We got the surface we could use to draw on. What I'm going to do though is actually switch around to a view where I can see that surface like the front elevation, zoom out. And now I can say, under modeling in place, I will create the revolution, or the revolve. Say, oh, you need to get, tell me what plane you're drawing on. And I can go through and find that. Where did it go? Where's my revolve surface? There it is. Choose it. OK, now I can do the same thing I did just on the floor. I'll make a nice little planter. That's my example always when I do vertically. Okay, let me give a nice axis of revolution. Let me finish the revolve. Okay, and there it is hanging out like a bathtub. Okay. So this revolve is kind of incredibly powerful because there's all sorts of things like planters and funny shapes that really are defined that way. They're lathed. So if you want to, for example, do a dome, the revolve is probably the best way to do it because you can't extrude a dome. You have to revolve a dome. Okay. If you want to put holes in the dome or holes in this thing, how do you do it? You might have to sort of combine a void intersected with it to kind of get exactly the shape you want. So you always have to be really creative about this in terms of thinking about the correct you know, sequence of how to get what you want. Because it may be adding, it may be subtracting. Yes, Rad. Say again? Oh, yes. OK, no worries. Where I'm getting all that, let me close this whole element by saying finish. OK, and now all these things are here. The weird thing about these things, actually, is though they're all, since they got defined as part of one element, they really are one element. So if I move them, they're all going to move together. Whatever I'm going to do to them, they're all going to they're go together. Let me undo that. But how I get to that in the first place is either if I'm going to create a new one, I say component model in place. If I want to edit the existing one, I choose it, and then I say edit in place. Okay, but get used to that because that's actually sort of the, probably the most common confusion people have about this is to get to the interior pieces, you have to grab the big piece, the whole element, and say edit it, and then you get to the smaller pieces, the forms inside of it. Okay, final two concepts, hopefully we'll get these through this quickly, is as follows. There's this notion of a sweep. Let's show you what that is. Sweeps we actually played around with a little bit already because when we were doing oh, reveals or we were doing sweeps around the top of a wall, it was the same concept. What you do with sweeps is you choose a path you want to follow. And for example, I can pick a path like, oh, see if I can do it. 
these edges. And I can choose the edges all the way around the top of this little uh, fireplace thing. Okay. After I've chosen a path to follow, what I need to do is just choose a profile. And I can load a profile if I don't have the right one in here. I can create a profile. But let me choose sort of a simple one like, oh, this kind of, um, what do I got there? Wall niche, sill precast. Let me go for this little eight inch wide sill. You can even sort of see what the profile looks by, like by zooming in there. You can see it in there? So when I say finish the sweep, it'll just trace that profile all the way around. So that's actually kind of a very nice thing. You can go through and edit that profile if you want to a little bit. You can use the offsetting to bring it up or bring it down a little bit. We can give it a material. We can flip it at a slight angle. For example, if you know that profile just wants to be rotated 45 degrees, you can do that. Whatever it's going to take to sort of make the shape you want. So sweeping a profile is just kind of the quickie way of doing something like that. And then last but not least, let me show you the final piece, and then we'll turn you loose for today. And that's a swept blend. Okay, A swept blend is amazingly like a sweep, only the big difference is I can only sort of choose a single segment. Swept blends are going to do something complicated. They're not only going to sweep, but instead of making an extrusion along that path with one profile, it's going to start with one profile and finish with a different profile. Okay. And that's just starting to get to be a little bit complicated as far as the geometry goes. Okay, so we'll choose that. We'll say that's our path. It's a simple path. Let me go ahead and choose one profile for the front. Oh, I'll go ahead and choose like this little sill precast at the front. Okay, notice I've sort of, it's, you can sort of see it right there. Let me go ahead and I will go to the swept blend and choose a profile for the other side. And for the other side, I will choose something, oh, simpler. What do I want to do? Like this little uh, inch and a half circle. That's going to be fine. So there it is on this side. So when I finish that, what it actually does is creates a custom piece of geometry that just sort of blends between those two things. So if you can imagine, we can blend, sweep, extrude, and all those things at the same time. And it really gets to be quite kind of uh, powerful in terms of what you can do. So that's really where we're going to leave you today. Let's say that those tools are available to you. You're not expected to use all those tools you know, in the assignment, certainly. As we go forward, really, I'm just trying to, again, give you tools to work with so that if you need to kind of create a piece of geometry that we don't have, you have the ability to go ahead and try and model that. And Again, just sort of get that some level of detail. You want something that's going to suggest a fireplace, even if it doesn't have every last brick and piece of the mantle kind of put into it. I'll finish the model. Again, if I need to edit a piece of that, what I have to do is select it, edit in place, and then I can get back to the forms again that are making it up independently. So let us go ahead and stop there. We're going to come around. You have a general question? Or what? Can you load multiple components at the same time? You yes. Can yes, you can. That's a very good question. The question is, can you load more than one component at the same time? That's a very good one, because it's you can. Let me say place. I will say load. I'll go out there and, oh, I want to grab some furniture. So let me just get uh, these pieces of furniture. I can grab them all at the same time. And that'll just be, it'll speed things up. So now five of them just come and load inside. The law will be in the menu there in just a second. OK, so that, that'll make life a little bit easier for you. It's going to say there's already some of these loaded. I'll say, sure, go ahead and overwrite the existing ones. But yeah. You mean that this app just reduces the size of your file? Say again? If you load a bunch of components, does it just increase the yes. size of Yes. As you load more and more components, the size of all those gets embedded in your model. So that's why, yeah, don't load 200 of them. Go ahead and kind of you know, get, get twice as many as you need. But then, yeah, because what happens is the files, you might even notice right now, as you're working with them, you probably have a file that's like four or five megabytes big. It's somewhere in there. Yeah. Right well, you're, that's, you've modeled quite a bit of stuff. My house files tend to get to be oh, 50, 60 megabytes. 
If I load, yeah, you want to keep them, it's, it's a file transfer issue, so try to keep them as lean as you want. In fact, let me just kind of show you, since you're on a good question there, if you want to, under, oh, let me see if it's under manage now. Let me cancel out of this model. I'll discard the changes. Let me, where do I go? There's something about purging unused things. There's purging unused. If you've loaded so much stuff in there and oh, you're just, your model's gotten so large that you can't possibly deal with it because it's getting very big to put up and down to the file transfer, or especially if you're working off site with several other people, you have this thing where um, things used to be too big. Oh, I might have crashed it now. Don't do that. But basically, it's this purge unused option. And purge unused, uh, here it's going to come. It's going to show you all these things that are loaded in here right now just aren't being used right now. So if I want to, I can say OK, and it'll knock those ones out because I don't really need to keep them around anymore. Actually, no, it's the other. Uh, only it's the check boxes that you'll remove. OK, Got it. okay? now watch out. Exactly. As you remove all the objects you used. So before you do that, yeah, save. Save a separate copy just to be on the safe side.